Welcome back to Murder with Friends. Today we're talking about the Beltway Snipers and where we're jumping in, it's October 2002 and the snipers are terrorizing the DC area, but police are hot on their trail. And this is where things start to get interesting because they start to create a profile given the random killings that they've witnessed. Let's go to a clip right now and take a look. Police knew each victim was shot from 100 to 200 yards away, but they didn't know where the shooter was located. The FBI used television and film animation software to build models of the crime scenes to determine where the shooter was positioned. And since the shooter got away cleanly, some believed that two people were involved, a spotter and a shooter. My theory was there was a driver with him, that that's how he was getting away. You kill one person, you kill two people. I think that, was a, that would be a pretty good day, you know, for a normal psychopathic murder. But now you go on to the third to fourth within two hours. So at that point, I felt as though there were two people. So this is where the case starts to get really interesting. And if you remember from the first part, I said I wanted to sort of conceal the identity of the killers until we got into the case, because I think that's what makes the story so interesting. They do not fit the normal profile of a spree killer. And uh, JR, I found this from a 2005 New York Times article called Mass Murderers Fit Profile, as do many others who don't kill. Basically talking about the profile of spree killers, mass murderers. And this is what they say. Those who study these types of mass murders have found that they are almost always male, all but two of the 160 cases isolated by Dr. Dew. Most are single, separated, or divorced. The majority are white, with the exception of student shooters at high schools or lower schools. They are usually older than the typical murder, often in their 30s or 40s. So this doesn't fit with the people that we are talking about today. And uh, they, they start to realize this because by October 4th, authorities were able to forensically link the shootings from October 3rd and October 2nd. They're, they're, they're bringing in what they know about these killers. They know that they're now operating in a team, which is also very atypical of uh, spree killers, because usually mass murderers, I'm thinking of the exception, which would be Columbine, um, they operate alone. These are loners that want to make a point. Rarely do you find someone that uh, m that is on the same page as you that wants to bring this terror and the, the way that they did it so systematically and so methodically, it, the, how do you find a, another counterpoint? How do you find someone that, that agrees with you here? So you're always worried about uh, maybe breaking up the whole thing. What's the old uh, the old adage, there's no honor between thieves? Right. So once you get a couple of bad guys together, eventually one of them's gonna be a little less bad than the other, or then they'll get a little more shook than the other, or get worried about what's gonna potentially happen, mm -hmm. and then maybe they might give give up the situation or they might go to the authorities and start feeling guilty. You never mm -hmm. know who's gonna be as evil as each other in order to carry out the plan equally. So to imagine that just doesn't add up. And I think they even knew that to a degree. There was enough of analysis about our society and the way they're perceived and where they're coming from to say, they'll never think it's us. It was after the 13, it was at the 13 year old scene where the 13 year old kid was shot. They're using Ziploc bags to cover up the cards mm -hmm. or whichever pieces of correspondence they wanna go with. And this is again, Back to forensic files. I fucking mm -hmm. love this show. Mm -hmm. So now you think about everything you do in your life where you're leaving traces of yourself. Mm -hmm. So just zipping a Ziploc bag. I get maybe if you get your finger in the middle of it, but who does that? Just running your hand across the outside of the Ziploc bag, if it's strong enough and has little ridges, mm -hmm. yellow and blue make green, then suddenly you're, uh, you're leaving your DNA everywhere. But it's, it's the ego with the leaving of the clues. It's the carelessness. Yeah. It's the, it's sort of, it's the hubris where they're, they're thinking, I, I can't be caught and here, and so therefore, here's my DNA. You'll never be able to trace this back to me. Um, but actually what, what happened was in a note that the killers left for the police, they referenced a crime that they had committed in Montgomery, Alabama on their way to get to the DC area. Once they were linking themselves, in the note, they linked themselves to this, the police were able to go back to what happened in Montgomery, Alabama, uh -huh. see what evidence was collected, and they found that there was this magazine that was left at the scene of the crime, and that magazine had the thumbprint of Lee Boyd Malvo, oh and very quickly they were able to tie um, Lee Boyd Malvo to John Allen Muhammad. And that was the absolute game changer here. And I, I really think that publicly, the, the DC authorities, the officials, they got a lot of flack because it seemed like people were just dying left and right, and they were. A lot of people lost their lives. Mm -hmm. But the police work within the month of October and the efficiency with which they were able to communicate between departments once they knew what was going on, and that took a while, yeah. um, was is really remarkable here. That they were able to get that thumbprint from Lee Boyd Malvo and then 
by looking into his life, realize his ties to John Allen Muhammad, which we will get into, because they weren't biologically related. Um, right. That was really powerful You have to work. get enough help from society. It was, became a nationwide manhunt in a way, but it became a nationwide story. Everyone kept hearing about it, where you needed help from, from the public, but then you also wanted to keep certain information from the public so they wouldn't blow up any kind of lead you have to get to where it was. It's such a balancing act, and mm -hmm. then you start feeling for the investigators and trying to get this done. It's, let's give them information, let's not give them information. We need someone to identify this. The, the lines were open for tips constantly. They got calls from the killers themselves. One of the two, I think it was Leboy, who called them. I believe that was actually John Allen Muhammad yes, called. Because once we get into the dynamic between these, these pair of killers, we will see that John Allen Muhammad really was the, the ringleader right. here. He was the one that orchestrated oh. this plan to a very vulnerable, naive, uh, and impressionable Lee Boyd Malvo. And he was the one that I believe was uh, was writing the notes, mm -hmm. that was that had this very elevated sense of self that he's going to get away with it, and that also was calling uh, the police and giving them these instructions and leaving these bizarre notes that uh, right. we're going to throw up a photo of right now yeah. so that you guys can see. He was asking for ten million dollars. Uh, he was saying. Uh, all, like he riddles. was saying, riddles, hide your children. <laughs> he referenced a Cherokee fable, mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, a duck and a noose, the duck and noose fable. Very bizarre messages, and that the authorities then had to keep the public safe, let them know that they were dealing mm -hmm. with it, but they also had to give sort of, uh, what, what's the word for um, cryptic messages to mm -hmm. the killers as well. It was a very bizarre line of communication that opened up, and it all happened within the public eye within just the month of October. Now we referenced it a little bit earlier. I want to go to a clip of the break in the case that gave up the identities of Malvo and Mohammed. The sniper's note mentioned the Alabama shooting once again. A second call to Montgomery revealed more information. A magazine had been dropped at the crime scene. It had a fingerprint on it, but local officials said they had not processed the print. The magazine was immediately flown to Washington. And lo and behold, the fingerprint matches Lee Boyd Malvo. Lee Boyd Malvo was a 17-year-old from Jamaica. He had been fingerprinted by immigration officials in Bellingham, Washington. So that gave us basically an individual and a face to a fingerprint. Police were convinced that the teenager had an accomplice. If we could just have 24 hours with this information before the media gets a hold of it, that we could catch them. But if this were to leak, they would be in the wind and probably not surface for a very long time. So to give you guys an idea of the timeline and just how quickly this all was happening, October 19th is when they found that note that referenced the crime in Montgomery, Alabama, that gave them the thumbprint of Lee Boyd Malvo, which by the way, I've been thinking this in my head the whole time, that is a tongue twister of a name, Lee Boyd <laughs> Malvo. I know I've been kind of fucking it up. By October 22nd, um, they will strike again. The killers will strike again. Um, and then it would be a tip from a friend of John Allen, because John Allen also was communicating with the police. So I know this is getting very convoluted and confusing. It was for the police as well. If yeah. you're feeling confused, then that's how you should be feeling. They get a tip from the police that would lead the authorities to Mohammed's car. They were able to track his tags. It was a uh, Washington state plate, but it was registered to New Jersey. And it was the Chevy uh, Caprice that had been reported at a lot of the crime scenes. They knew what they were looking for. And then by October 24th, 2002 at 3.15 a.m., Malvo and Mohammed were apprehended uh, peacefully, actually, just right. at, a, at a rest stop. So that's sort of a, a fortunate conclusion to that. But think about that. We started the 19th, they find the letter that gets them the thumbprint in a whole different state. And then they strike again in the 22nd. Meanwhile, they have been calling police. They have been communicating with the police. The police have been communicating with the killers through the press. And then on the 24th, they are apprehended. That, I mean, that plays out like a Criminal Minds episode, that they were <laughs> exactly. able to do that. Because they had to find the identity of Malvo, who was, mm -hmm. again, not biologically related to John Allen, and figure out why they came to DC, what's going on here, what is the story, how can we track them, getting the tags mm -hmm. on the cars. It, I, it really does play out like an episode of a TV show with how quickly and condensed they were able to work and with again, the information this provided. All makes, I feel like they maybe the police themselves probably got a bad rep 
for how long it took for the fear that was going on. Kids couldn't play outside. There was no recess. It was code blue in Montgomery yeah, County. Yeah, they were considering not even even canceling school. But then, so then you think about the small things that could have that just let it happen like that. The fingerprint. Imagine this kid didn't grab the magazine. Then what happens from that point on? Mm -hmm. And they're just asleep in the car. How soon could they have been gone? Mm -hmm. As as uh, the investigator mentioned in that clip, how soon could they have been gone if they just knew what was happening? Do you think that? if they had not opened up a line of communication with police, that they would have been apprehended as quickly as they no. were? They, they, it, it's an, an aspect of putting the puzzle together. You can't start, and again, it's so crazy. Like you said, it's like an episode of these shows. It's exactly what happens. They start getting uh, ahead of themselves, their head gets too big, and they start giving clues. Like, well, this isn't too easy. We need at least someone to be on our tails for a minute. Like, if they could have escaped the rest stop, mm -hmm. then maybe they would have calmed down, and be like, okay, that was, that was scary enough. Mm -hmm. We can lay low for a week and then start back up again. Do you think that when they start leaving clues, because this is something I've asked myself with the, the Zodiac killer and um, with other killers who have left clues behind. When a killer leaves clues, is it them wanting to be caught? I think they want to now manipulate, because they're probably watching the way these types of killers are, The going back to the mm -hmm. stereotypical serial killer, they watch their infamy rise on television. And so they're probably watching news reports, watching how scared everyone is to decide what they're going to do next. And like, this would be cool. Let's control this situation. I don't want them to say certain things about me. I want them to call me the name that I put on the tarot card. I want them to wonder who the hell is this. And they get this rise out of watching their reactions. Mm -hmm. So you can't get a reaction you want if you don't provide anything. Yeah. I don't no. think they're looking to get caught. I think they're looking to control the situation further. Yeah, I, th I think it is maybe a desire mm -hmm. for control, and mm -hmm. especially when we get into the personality types of uh, yeah. John Allen Muhammad and the control that he exercised over uh, Lee Boyd Malvo, I think that that's definitely a theme. Yeah. And actually, that brings us to the third, the third segment. So when we come back, we're going to dive in a little bit about the themes that were presented at the trial. What are the motives here? And then we're going to tell you about these two individuals and how they met and how they developed this murderous pact. We'll see you in part three. Ha <laughs> ha